Um, here's a question. What did you or others and Richie Williams see in Tim Ream that so many other teams passed on in the draft? I think you guys even had uh, a pick before Tim Ream as well because he went at 18th, I think, in the beginning of the second round. Uh, seven guys that were picked ahead of him played a grand total of 22 games last year. Um, while Ream, I mean, Tim was a mainstay, and in all honesty, uh, in my opinion, he should have won Rookie of the Year. I mean, how do you know a guy like that? Obviously, sometimes it's shot in the dark, but did you guys see something about him that, that let you know right away, even when he first arrived, that this guy had some talent, he was going to be a defensive star? Yeah, I mean, I think Tim has had a phenomenal season, and, and uh, you know, it, it, he, he's really done a good job. And in his position, we really needed to improve and strengthen, and um, we couldn't be happier with his first year. And, and again, I want to just preface all of this by saying it's only one year. We, we you know, he still has a lot, a lot more uh, to go, and, and uh, it's a little bit more difficult doing it when it's expected of you than when it's not expected of you. But uh, we, we, we do have, have um, you know, big plans for Tim. I think he's, he's obviously a mainstay in, 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 the, in the back line. Um, in terms of what we saw, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to project um, what a college player is going to do or be um, at that level. And, um, there's, you know, there's, there's part of it is just doing as much due diligence on the player. And the other part of it's a, a little bit of your gut feeling. And the last part of it's probably a little bit of luck. And I think the, the three of them probably came into play uh, when we picked him. Obviously, we had uh, Tony Chani and Austin Deleuze before him. And Tim was actually the third player we chose uh, in, in the draft. And, you know, you just don't know if he's going to make it number one, and if he does, how you know how much he can contribute. But um, we couldn't be happier with 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 Tim's uh, first year last year, and we we do expect big things out of him um, for the future here at Red Bull. Yeah. What did you uh, What did you think of his two starts for the U.S. national team? Yeah, you know, I I, I think he's done well. I, you know, it's uh, the 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 game against Chile obviously um, was a game of mostly MLS players, mostly domestic, and some Scandinavian players. It was against a team that was, um, you know, in Chile, a very young team, too. And I, I think he held his own. I, I don't think there were a lot of great performances in that game, but I think Tim was solid, and, uh, and that's really what you ask out of a center back. Yeah, and please forgive Brett and I for getting goose pimples when we watched Tim and his, his great vision uh, downfield for a center back, frankly. Yeah. is is just something – it's sort of a natural thing. that That's not sometimes something you can actually teach a player – and uh, with our yeah. vulnerabilities at center back, um, it's always exciting to see, you know, this kind of uh, bright, fresh uh, face uh, coming up. Because it is, as you know, and I think th th that a lot of us feel this way, center back looks to be kind of a weak position for us uh, in the future. And this may be the remedy. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you. I think there's there's probably a lack of depth at that position, not only, in, you know, not only in our league, but... but um, with our national team, I don't think there's a lot of depth uh, in our back line, and and obviously to bring in a player who can give you some of that depth, um, I think is very important. Tim's one of Tim's greatest assets as a as a, as a center back is his distribution and his vision, and you just don't you really don't see that type of of calmness in a player that young, yeah. uh, being able to do that on on all you know all levels, and and so uh, we're we're very excited to see that, and we want to make sure that continues. Between the uh, between internet bloggers and the posters on said bloggers, uh, there's been a lot of comparisons between Reem and uh, Parkhurst. Um, what do you think of that comparison? Well, I think they're a little different players. You know, I think Michael uh, predominantly played in a back three, and he was more of a free player yeah. uh, with New England. Um, I don't think Tim, you know. I think Tim's more of a, a, um, a left sided player in a back four. I think he reads the game very well. I don't think he will play as free as, as Michael Parkhurst, but in terms of distribution and just the sort of the soccer IQ part of it, I think there are some similarities there. Yeah. We're going to skip a little ahead because we don't want to run out of time too fast, but uh, one of the questions I definitely uh, want to get in this segment, which is playing with three designated players and how manageable that is in the MLS, or have you guys learned something from that, or is it smarter, in fact, to develop sort of a two-DP team that leaves more – cap space for uh, quality support players. I mean, it, it's a fine line. It's a balancing act, I know, but uh, what are your feelings about that? Yeah, it is uh, it is a balancing act. I mean, you've got uh, three DPs that eat up uh, about 40 to 45% of your, your total cap. 
which is a lot of money. And, yeah. and, you know, as you saw with L.A. a number of years ago, when you put that, you know, that kind of money into two or three players where, you know, they had Beckham, obviously, Donovan and Ruiz at one time, it's hard to put quality players around them. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one player, two players, three players, you know, just don't make a team. You need... You know, you need to be 15 to 18 deep, uh, especially in a long season like uh, like we do in MLS. Um, and so it's quite difficult to, to, to juggle that and, and make sure you, you get quality um, uh, people in, 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 in positions around the designated players. But um, you, know, you can't afford to have a designated player not get the job done on the field because of the number of uh, cap space that he does eat up. Uh, so it's it's uh, that, that's, that one you got to get right on, on all levels. Yeah. yeah. It is. It's a balancing act, without a doubt. Um, but two DPs at this point, with the cap where it is, seems more manageable. But I want to get to, to Hans Baca because he succeeded where a lot of other foreign uh, managers have, in fact, failed. Because and, and there's this big thing on on the blogs and and, and in soccer uh, posts everywhere that you have to know MLS to coach or be a manager in MLS. Uh, maybe it's a false assumption that a lot of people built on Rude Gullet's failure, um, but you know how how did Hans, in your opinion, kind of evolve quickly into this um, real successful manager at uh, New York? It, it, that's a great uh, great question. You know, I think um, coming into MLS and not having any knowledge of uh, the players or the league. Uh, makes it very difficult. It's not impos impossible, and as, as Hans has shown, um, you can do it, but uh, you've got to have people around you that understand the league, and you have to trust those people. Um, and I think that was a, a product of that. But the, 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 I think the biggest thing that Hans brought to, to this team last year was, was accountability um, and, uh, and the system. I, I think um, in, in previous years, uh, there wasn't a system in place where players were communicated what that what that uh, what their role was and and were held accountable and so um, you know I, I think what, that was the first thing that Hans did he came in and, and devised you know the first probably four to six weeks were were defensive shape I mean every day the yes. team did defensive shape and he held players accountable for for doing a, a, a good job in that and I think that's been the biggest difference he. You see the number of goals we gave up in 2009, uh, and and that's a complete reversal in 2010. And you know, in this league or in this sport, if if you continually leak goals, no matter how good you are going forward, you're 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 going to lose games. And Brett, you know how much I just talked about shape, 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 shape with Baca, and and it, I, I have to say that's exactly the first thing I saw. Uh, no matter where the ball, if you could drop a ball on the field anywhere and say, everyone shift where you ought to be. And I think that was the first thing I noticed about New York. Everybody was where they needed to be, and uh, it was great to watch. It was especially even the friendly against, I think it was, what, Santos? You immediately noticed yeah. that change. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Hans, uh, you know, that is one of his strengths is his is ability to put uh, in a system, uh, make it understandable, and, and make sure that players are, are, are doing their jobs. 